fundamentally, if we if you're going to talk about almsgiving, I'm, so there's this like idea of being all in, right? <laughs> and so, like this Peace Corps model we use, Father, it puts these folks all in on mm-hmm. some level. Mm-hmm. Now, what are they all in to do? So, <laughs> I was telling a story of, uh, with Vin that we're not in. We don't build altars. So for me, the Orthodox character who's a missionary is ultimately going to lay an altar. And then because you're going to serve liturgy, like, and then from, from there, who knows what happens? All kinds of stuff happens. We're not going to have a propositional conversation about who Jesus is. Maybe you will if someone's asking, but it's not the point of our work. It's not what we're doing. What we're, what, what all in is, is a full, immersion, imbibing totally local culture, not just colonial culture. So in West Africa, I was telling you guys that um, essentially local culture is Mende culture where our guys work. And it's really, it's it's Eastern uh, Sierra Leone near the Liberian border. And so to be all in is to learn Mende, also Creole, which is the English, hmm. sort of the spoken English there. It's, it's, a, it's a hybrid. And... Uh, essentially to learn the local language and then get to know local folks. So you you can hang out with the mayor. That's fine. You can hang out with the NGOs and they're around. But the idea really is to take tea with folks who probably never went to school and then find really badass people there who have great ideas because they do, because going to school is not indicative. It doesn't tell you that someone's Mm -hmm. smart. It just tells you they went to school Mm -hmm. and a lot of local people have great ideas. So our job is really about, um, if you if you think about it, it's about identification, but to identify is to understand the culture. And then when you identify the right people, we fuel their projects by building capacity for their projects. So maybe they need a, a marketing campaign. Maybe they need, because they don't read or write so well, they need uh, help with the internet or often we'll connect them to buyers if it's a business style project. If it's a school, we'll connect them to curriculum writers or, or bring money often. So that's what we're doing, but all in, in this case, I was, I'll just tell this story essentially is a, a really good person uh, whom I love. He happened to be Orthodox. Not all our guys are Orthodox uh, has been in uh, Sierra Leone for just about a year now. And all hell broke loose because to be all in is to put on the culture on some level. And so his all in was getting to know um essentially teaching about the faith so he wore his cassock with a blessing he did a lot of work that looked orthodox but had a kind of a western ring to it let me pray with you using the psalms let me let me try to understand you by you understanding me kind of built a mm-hmm. chapel with an outward facing you know sign saint mark's chapel and basically what happened was, is he got off the rail of what we try to do. But Father, uh, again, I'm not going to tell you who this person is, but he woke up sweating, half naked in front of his icons, seeing visions. Um, uh, he was like the these stories from, from you know, St. Anthony's time. So he was... Uh, identifying families who had babies that were going to die in his visions. And he was telling them and reading prayers over them. He, uh, wait, did any of these babies actually die though? Not yet. (laughs) And I don't think they will, but right. Essentially for about three weeks, he was getting worse and worse. So I don't know what we call this. You know, people I talked to say he was having (laughs) a, I don't to call it. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. 
I guess I'm your host today, Cyprian. And uh, today we have no Andrew. Andrew and family are feeling a little under the weather, but it gave us the opportunity to bring on a special guest. So Father Turbo and I are welcoming John Hears to the show. And we, I know that this is going to be a great conversation. We would usually have like a little uh, icebreaker, but I think that we, <laughs> I, I think we've already <laughs> Just melted the ice. I think we've Jeez. already had the icebreaker and we'll, we'll, I, th I think we want to explore this story that we've now heard because it goes directly into it. But before we do, before we explore the story and, and go deeper, because I think that it's just going to that 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 vein, that stream, we've got it all for the for the people who don't know you, because you've been gracious enough to, to have us on uh, for the people who don't know you and know what you do, which I know that we're going to find out uh, across the next two hours, obviously. But if you want to just give a quick intro so that we've got some some background for the folks who don't know you and your organization sure. and the other things that you do, and then we'll just we'll, we'll move forward because I want to carry on with the story. Yeah, I love you guys. Thanks. Uh, so First Things Foundation is, is what a friend and I founded. 2014 is when our first guy went into the field. And the first thing is relationships in any type of giving. So the idea of giving without a really foundational relationship, well, I mean, it's not terrible. It's not the worst thing that ever happened. But we saw that it was going off the rails when we did development work as younger men. And uh, we also saw it in the classroom. We were t I was teaching at that time. And fundamentally, we were giving people uh, curriculums because we wanted them to have information so that they could be properly formed without really ever wondering what it is they wanted in the classroom. There was very little relationship in that. So we both decided to start this Peace Corps-like organization that sends people for two years at a time. And we take a bet. And the best way to say it is we bet that if we stay long enough and live close enough to what everyone on this call would call something like serious poverty, um, you know, less than $2 a day, places like Sierra Leone, Mozambique, Georgian Republic, Guatemala, that if you do that and stay long enough, that you'll find really good people who have great ideas about what they need and what their community needs, communities that aren't heard from. So we try to get under that core of government to government aid and just go directly to local people. And often they're entrepreneurs, but that's not a good term to use. Um, overseas because it implies individual sort of bootstrapping to lift yourself up or something. And in old world communities, that's not how community works. There aren't individuals doing anything. I mean, if they do, they have to give it all back. It's a, uh, it's, it's natural in especially West Africa and East Africa to just you you're not known to them as the rich guy you're known to them as the rich guy who's also supplying everybody in the village with what they need so long story short we try to find these unique people and families and often they're like cooperative groups sometimes they're whole villages we work with and we help them build capacity for their projects this idea comes out of my experience in peace corps i love peace corps so peace corps if you don't know what that is i think most people know but it's it's the government trying to meet people's needs, but it's our government talking to other governments and those governments tell our government where to put the Peace Corps people. Often it's in education because everybody thinks education will rise, raise everybody up. What we do is say, I don't know, what, when our guys go, guys and girls, I mean men and women. So when our guys go, we don't have a project for them. It's learn local language and live hard, live in a mud hut, live with a family in Guatemala. You you live according to the, le the, the, the impoverishment of the people that you serve. Um, and that's kind of weird for an American mind. <laughs> You're like, well, what? when I'm trying to raise money, it's always like, well, what do you guys do? And I'm like, well, we did a school <laughs> and then we did a sewing cooperative that's turned into a, a really cool business. We did a restaurant and they're like, I don't really get what you do. I'm like, like I said, it depends on what the people... Mm -hmm. are telling us they need, which is a very un-American way to approach stuff. So long story short, our guys do that for two years at a time. When they come back, we try to, um, well, now they often come back to our restaurant 
sort of get reacquainted with America. And um, we started a restaurant to support our work. It's also a nonprofit restaurant called Capi, K-E-I-P-I, based on the Georgian tradition of toasting. Because, and I'll just close it up by saying this, because our work is about meeting. It's about face-to-face relationships. And if you've ever been to a Georgian, it's sometimes called a supra, it's the liturgical tradition played writ large. So we all know what the liturgical tradition looks like on any given Sunday. But in Georgia, and a lot of the old world, especially the old world Orthodox East, every dinner is a replay of the agape feast. And mm-hmm. so what happens is, is when you play it over and over, it kind of gets in your blood. And what I realized about Georgian culture, which is similar to other old world cultures, is everything is a moment of hospitality or healing, right? Hospital. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, whoa, this is why people all appear very poor, but yet manage to live something like a coherent life. And now don't get me wrong. There's moments where the poverty is crushing. So I don't want to, I don't want to say that's not true, but I realized that actually part of our work is to send Americans to remember this moment of hospitality in their everyday life. And when our guys come back, I have to tell you, Cyprian, it's, it's gorgeous. Talk about the red pill. You know, everybody's talking about the red pill on the internet. I love it. It's a real thing, but they've imbibed it. And now they can't almost put it off. This is what happened to me in Peace Corps. Um, And so essentially our work is, I call it missionary work, but it doesn't, you won't recognize it like that because you're, you're missionizing the cent, the one cent and the one cent too, but you're not doing it with the propositional biblical conversation. It's not like that. So that's what we do. But as I was saying, it can get a little I mean, sideways. It's, I it's mean, it's interesting. To me. Go ahead, Father. Sorry. I just want to say just, it's, it's interesting though, because this is one of those moments where I'm just kind of like being a little self-aware and reflecting on, um, I'm going to say this. And then I realize I think there's going to be a good kind of like portion of our audience that just is not going to have the context for what I'm going to say. But actually that's very much the Orthodox model though. Mm. You know what I mean? Because the the Orthodox model is, is not the, um, kind of explicit, you know, um, forward facing, um, leading with, you know, kind of dominance or even influence. Mm. It, it's, it really is the model of like, kind of like being with, and, uh, just, I'll just give you an example. Our model of evangelization, our, our, our model of missionary work is St. Herman. Alaska. I love it. I mean, that that's, that's our model. That's the Orthodox model. Um, and then there's some people who, if they're feeling feisty enough, they can be like, no, no, no. You're just kind of picking one example. I'll give you another example. Cyril Methodius, you know, uh, you know, we can just, we can keep love going it. on in regards of Nino from Georgia, Nino, yeah. St. Nino. I mean, we can just keep going on and on, but it is the Orthodox model as opposed to, what developed wasn't always like that, but what, I mean, what developed into the Western model of trying to, you know, like you were saying earlier about kind of introducing or getting to know a culture or people through like, you need to understand me. And once you understand me or you know what I'm about, then we can begin to relate. That's not the Orthodox model. No. So I just find it really just incredible and fascinating um, but also it, it, it kind of speaks to a, a bigger thing in that a lot of people, they're just not aware that that is the Orthodox model. Um, and unfortunately, I think some people could really miss the boat and not appreciate how um, the faith has spread beyond martyrdom, which is right. essentially what you're talking about. You know, it's it's continuing the ministry of Christ, which is, you know, healing the sick, casting out demons, you know, um, tending to those, you know, who are in need. And that's, you know, <laughs> it's unfortunately it's such a charged, like one of the biggest things uh, I'm really excited about is helping people to kind of dispel this idea that being a Christian is somehow 
politically tinged with being a liberal. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> being able to talk about these things has nothing to do with ideology or anything like that. That's right. It has having to do with with being the body of Christ and and doing the work of you know Christ in the world. So I just okay, wanted to kind of interject. That's super that. interesting though, and I'm interested to, you're the, like the the right left because it is the royal path after all. And I'm interested, John, to because I'm sure that you've thought about this. I, most people t- would tend to associate Peace Corps or the style of work that you're doing, right, with the political left and maybe even yeah. far left. Mm-hmm. Right? But here, I think you said most of the people that are involved and that are going out on the missions per se are are orthodox, right? It's about 50-50 in our organization. And so I find that to be really interesting because most people would look at Orthodox and be like, well, that's the the right, maybe even far right, if you're an American Orthodox, perhaps. Mm -hmm. How does does that reconcile? Like, how do those two things come together in your organization? Oh, man, you're in it. This is the... (laughs) Here's how... Here's how... Man, is this right on the money with Royal Path? Okay, so I think of this as like... um, a rocket ship going into space and you know how it gets closer, closer and closer to leaving the orbit. It's just shaking like crazy. This is how we feel all the time. We're shaking, we're shaking, we're shaking because on one end you get an Orthodox narrative. That's we're not doing Orthodox work. Father Turbo, they're not saying what you just said. Mm -hmm. They're saying, where are the Greeks? Are Mm -hmm. there Greeks involved in this? Mm -hmm. Like, are you evangelized? They have a very Protestant mindset about what that's mm-hmm. going to happen. And so they're like looking at us like, what are you doing? And we're, that's causing us to shake. Then if you go to the liberal side, whatever that is, secular, whatever it is, mm-hmm. what they're saying is, 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 is a whole different thing, which is you guys sound like you're trying to do something religious <laughs> all the time. Like it smells religious to me. Why don't you bring them what they need? And I'm like, well, why, why do I have, where did I get the card to tell them what they need? Where did that come from? Now I find on the left, they're very willing to do that. They have a very colonial model on the left. Mm -hmm. It usually is education. I had someone really able to give quite a bit of money once at a dinner table. I want to tell you this story. And I told her about what we did. She says, that's fascinating. I really want to help Africa. You're in Africa. Your guys are there. So let's do schools. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, in, in the part of Sierra Leone we're in, nobody's really asking for schools. There's quite a few schools. She goes, but don't you think they need good schools? And I was like, well, I I think so. I, Yeah, but where are you getting your information? I'm not asking her that, Father, but... She was persistent. If you do schools, I can help you. So we didn't do, we didn't work with her. Because that you right there, John. I just want to say this because today on the calendar is Saint Benedict. We're in a world calendar. Mm-hmm. So today is Saint Benedict Nursia. And Saint Benedict, as many may or may not know, dropped out of school intentionally. You know, and was like, what's the real learning that I need? Exactly. You know what I mean? I just, I want to bring that up because St. Benedict who, you know, Orthodox through and through, and it's one of the, he, his, you know, the, the Benedictines, right. Mm-hmm. One of the last kind of vestiges of, of the ancient church and in, in left in Rome, you know, the Roman tradition. It's like, it's it, the root in which he came out of was this kind of understanding that it's not about quote unquote yeah. schooling. You know? and, and and it might be. It could be. It could, it could be. But. It could be that the community is asking for that. But what both sides are trying to do, I just see them both equally colonial in their approach, mm-hmm. which is some Orthodox people are like, give them orthodoxy. I'm like, okay, but what 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 form are you talking? What what do you mean exactly? And then the other side is give them what you know what we have because what we have already is implicitly good. So what we're trying to do is strip it down like St. Herman. So what's really cool about that you brought up St. Herman, because we love him, is the 
the St. Herman went to attend to the Russians who had gone out a hundred years ahead of him to kill seals. I don't know if anybody knows this. St. Herman just didn't rock up on a bunch of Native Americans. There were Russians out there that said, we want liturgy. We married all these Aleut women, and now we have families, and we want you to come baptize our children. He was responding to a spiritual need. And then what happened was, is because he was trying to save his own soul, he wasn't there... They were attracted to his humility. Mm -hmm. And so we should we should be like that. I always tell our guys, when you get there, you say, why? Because because one of the weird things is because all these colonial people have gone before us, the people, the Mende people or the Makua people or the Bambara people in Africa, they always ask, what did you come to build? <laughs> like, well, what do you want? It's a really weird question. They're like, they think I'm trying to fool them. Like, mm. And if I say schools, then we'll get the money. And everybody knows what happens is if you go to build a school in a place that doesn't want a school, they'll let you build the school. It'll never quite get finished, though, because mm. they don't actually want it. <laughs> they just want the money. And then you look right. around and go, oh, they build a whole new fences for their goats mm -hmm. because they only wanted the goats in the first place because the goats are what's making them their money. Mm -hmm. We see this again and again. There's layers of goodness. And all we're trying to do is like targeted aid that's authentic. Mm -hmm. And then the problem with that is you can't scale that very well. If you think about aid, you can't really scale that one guy wants a, these, these sewing machines. Another guy's trying to do a, a bee honey. We did a great honey project. In fact, we just heard from him after a, a year and he's he's got six more um, hives. It's very cool. But what I'm trying to say is, is you can't really scale it because each, each community or each family is doing their own thing. And so I'm, I'm comfortable with that because, because we're not out to try, this is the Orthodox part. We ain't trying to save the world. Mm -hmm. Like that's saved already. Mm -hmm. That's great. What we're trying to do is become better people through the act of the act of sacrifice, which is an old fashioned idea that sacrifice, right? Creation begins with sacrifice, which is the Christic idea, right? Which is Christ first went up and suffered and then down and into the ground in order to be born again. So sorry, I like people who want to help people, but never actually do the work. Mm -hmm. I love those people because we'll do the work on their behalf. And that's a good thing too. Not everybody has to go into the field, but somebody's got to do the suffering. <laughs> sorry. There's, there's an interesting, mm -hmm. I mean, this, this notion or this concept, it's just, it, it, Man, it hit me like a, it hit me like a ton of bricks because it's like it feels like the fullness of a lot of the things that I talk to people when I talk to like people in private groups and things like that. People who come to me about entrepreneurship and they're like, how do I be a better entrepreneur? How do I build my business? How do I do these things? You know, this when you're you know, this idea of going and finding out what are the problems that people want. But I feel like the fullness of this or the problems that people have and how can you help. But I feel like the fullness is the why that you're like, when you brought up mm -hmm. St. Herman and also the people who are working with you, it's like, you're there to save your soul. That's right. That I feel like that is so lost. It certainly is lost in the colonial mindset, but I feel like it's even lost in, in people who I feel like have a, maybe a little bit of a better grasp and are wanting to do some good. You know, there still is this idea that, oh, I'm going to go out to these savages That's right, and I'm going to help them. And by but it's by me helping them and making them more like me yeah. that I will have saved my soul because I will. It will be my works and I will have done good things rather than saying like, no, it's your job to go there and, and humble yourself. That's right. And it's That's in right. the humility and the humbling of yourself that you mm -hmm. will save your soul. That part is like so crucial. But it's weird though, because I'm with you, but it's weird because at least in our tradition, it's everywhere, right? Save your soul and every a thousand around you. And then you're like, nah, not really. Like a thousand, you think a thousand. I'm like, yeah, a thousand or maybe a million. You just do the little things. But guys, it's not easy to sell in a Merc. Mm -hmm. It's, it's because we're so into this idea of scale 
and you know well because scale brings you more yeah and power like, like brings you more <laughs> you right. know what i mean that's right not not the person not the people it, the scale is never about serving scale is always about having you know saying that from prayer lust of power right wow. it, it's, oh, it's perfect timing yes it's, it's always it's always about that you know and it's really pernicious because you don't think it is you know it's it's in the veneer of- but it it's it's also it's not to say though i want to be careful it's not to say pick somebody auntie m mm-hmm. who through whatever machinations in the world is has a fortune it's not to say she has to go that's not really what we're trying to say but my guess is there's a service in her parting with something like her fortune. There is something in that that's also suffering for her. It, it's it's a, it's like a layer, right? Our guys are way out on the, it's, they're like Navy SEALs of service. But everybody's serving on some, in some way. And and if everyone understands their role in this, this service, that, that's beautiful. It's not, it's not an arrogance, because I think I can come across as arrogant about it. Um, but, but it's got to hurt, like, right? It's got to hurt. I mean, I think that's one of the things I, that father's always told me when it comes to almsgiving is like. Disgusting. Yeah, you know, you know, because people will be like, well, how much? How much should I give? What's the right. appropriate amount? And right. it's like, well, until it hurts, like when it hurts, right. when mm-hmm. it's uncomfortable, right. when it's suffering, mm-hmm. then it's the appropriate right. amount. Right. Mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. And, and the other thing is, is. OK. And I love it because it's incarnational too, by the way. Right, right. That, Thank that's God. there's a, it's an, it's an incarnational thing because part of the problem with giving exclusively, well, giving out of your comfort and giving money out of your abundance is that you can oftentimes miss that incarnational aspect of it, mm-hmm. right? And it, that and again, that doesn't mean that everyone needs to be in the field. Or doesn't mean that it needs to be in a soup kitchen, but but I do think that there is something to be said for, you know, just people getting out of the mindset that alms is always about giving X amount of dollars. That's right. That's right. You know, forgive me and, for interrupting. I just want to throw that out there. No, no, no. I, I guys, I talk a lot, so you interrupt me all the time. <laughs> but I, 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 here's the problem. I'm thinking about these things all the time, and so it's such a joy to be able to talk about them with you guys, because the other thing is, is the actual reality of the people who go and, and, you know, missionaries from Western missionaries too know this. It's sort of like a weird little secret in missionary communities. I I'd done this for six years of my life where I lived in communities we'd all call impoverished with no running water and no electricity. So almost seven years of no running water, no electricity in various places. And there's always a missionary community and all the missionaries know that they're getting more than they're giving, but they can't really talk like that because now suddenly someone's donating to their getting. Mm -hmm. And it seems weird to them. It's, it seems like it's all about the poor people. Wait, Forgive me. Forgive me, John. Forgive me. What what do you mean by their getting? they're getting more than they're giving in terms of financial. Like, can you expand no. on what you mean by that? Not, not financially. They're now, getting out of it. They're getting out of it more than they're, they're, they're growing and, and they're becoming awakened to their own. I'm talking about all types of missionaries. Yeah. They, they've they gone on an adventure that's, that's feeding their soul. And, and they're almost like embarrassed to say it because somehow that takes away from their almsgiving. Mm-hmm. Because I think we're so wedded to the idea of material as the point, but mm-hmm. there's there's a spiritual payoff, and that is a good thing. Like I love guys that interview with us, and I'll say, okay, so let's talk. Why do you want to go do this crazy thing? Let's talk. And you'll get basically two kind of people. One is is I'm lost. I need to find myself. These guys are fantastic. The other one you get is a very trained answer that it sounds like well i've looked at the inequalities around the world and i realize i've been blessed with so much and i want to go give back to people who are poor and don't have the opportunity i'm like okay that's gonna wear off in about 30 days okay because you're gonna realize 
The people you love, the poor people you want to help are jerks. Sometimes mm -hmm. they steal from you. Mm -hmm. They're not that friendly. Mm -hmm. And then what are you going to do? Because now the people you went to go help aren't very nice. So what are you going to do? How are you going to operate? And generally people will come home because it's not feeding them. Mm -hmm. And they're not in for the mission. They're not in for the journey. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But uh, guys, it's look, I don't know. I I'll mean, tell you what, though, people are people like what we do. The problem is, is they don't always they don't take the risk on the unknown because sometimes I can't tell them exactly how their money is going to be spent, other than feeding our field worker and housing our field worker. I can't always say that this exact thing will happen. You know, the way a school builder can say this school will be built just to these specifications. There'll be these many teachers. People like that certainty when they give. It's just it's interesting to me because. Man, I, I'm almost scared to open this can of worms because I, I just can spend the rest of the time just talking about, like, my experiences here in Kansas City. You know what I mean? Um, it's the same. I, I mean, yeah. And and to be, to be really kind of frank with you, it's like going through that whole process for myself, you know what I mean? Because essentially, you know, that's what I'm doing here. You know what I mean? Like I left Southern California with my wife and my kids and, you know, came to the inner city of Kansas City and all that stuff. And it's like, if you're going to do that, you know, your motivations are going to get sussed out really. Yeah. Not necessarily quick, but, but, but they're really going to get sussed out it, it, and you're going to find out real quick why you're doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you're also going to find it out, not just because of dealing with people who don't like you aren't grateful those things so if you're if you're into vainglory if you're wanting people to pat you on the back and be like oh thank you for saving me or you're wanting people to pat you on the back which this can people can feed off of this one a little bit longer oh you're such a great person that you do that mm -hmm. eventually that shelf life does yeah. run out That's you know what i mean um and so the other side of that though is you, you find yourself in this place of constantly asking, okay, well, what am I doing? Yes. Then, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Well, what, what am I doing? And I think for me, this is what's interesting to me about you. See, in my sense, in our sense here, it's like, okay, well, we have a parish, an Orthodox parish in the inner city. Okay, boom. We're on the east side of Kansas City bad neighborhood. We're in the hood, quote unquote. Okay, no problem. People can kind of get that, kind of, but where they get lost is, so what kind of programs you got? It's like, well, we got a farm um, and we got a school. Oh, perfect. Well, yeah, but like we would have that whether we were in the hood or not. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, it, it, it's, it isn't just about like, oh, let's do this for the people. Although the neighborhood, although it is there for them. But it's for us, right? Yes. Because, you know, we are repenting of consumerism or trying to. We're mm -hmm. repenting of just being disconnected from, you know, life as God intended it. We're repenting from, you know, shuffling off our kids to just kind of be eaten by the system. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the whole seraphim, sort of St. Seraphim comes in. It's like, well, yeah, well, you do save yourself. You know, you do acquire, excuse me, the, the grace of the Holy Spirit. And then a thousand rounds we say, but the problem with that is in, in our context, along the way, people are just not going to be happy because you're going to have people who are going to be like, well, why aren't you doing X, Y, and Z? That's right. Impact statement. And where's, where's the impact statement? Where's this and that? And that's why I find you so fascinating because we can get away with it because we're a church and because we're Orthodox. So it's kind of like a number one, no one knows what that means. B, number two, if they do know what it means and they're still talking to me after 10 minutes, then they probably know something about St. Herman and something about, you know, the, the kind of inner life. Okay. But in your case, I don't think people are necessarily going to always have that context. So that this, this principle, not a concept, but this principle of embodying Christ, mm -hmm. this principle of um, you know, being an ambassador, this, this principle of like a true ambassadorship. Ambassadorship isn't about going and putting 
um, your rules or even necessarily your culture. It's about representing your culture. It's about representing your nation. That That's a very different um, office than, let's say, you know, it's not it's, an ambassador is not a conquistador. That's right? right. Well done. I agree with that. Ambassador is not a conquistador. Ambassador is like, hey, I'm here in this land. And this is I'm representing I'm I'm representing whatever community culture state, you know, and like this is what I'm doing. I'm trying to dialogue with you. And I and I see what you're doing as a kind of ambassadorship mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, but it's just fascinating because I could see how it's a real struggle because people don't get the real impact, which is more of a um it's more of an authentic impact. What I mean by that is this, when you were talking about like, it's about a face-to-face encounter, what people don't understand, and this is what I've learned the hard way. Um, you, people don't get changed by giving them stuff. That's right. People, people don't get changed by necessarily doing something for them. People do get changed by doing something with them. With. Yes. You know what I mean? People do get changed by being with them. And it's like, You know, that in many ways is the test of true love. Yeah. You know, can you can you just sit and be with? Oh, my God. It's like I've said, it's like that's how I knew to marry my wife, because she was the only female that I'd ever been with where I didn't have to feel like I need to entertain or like you're boring me. Like, get out of here. You know, it's just like we could sit and just be. It's in our manual, actually. So now I'm giving you the guts. The manual, it's the emergent ship manual, the, the first phase, of what we do is actually you have to sit, take tea, and have five dinners. And then mm-hmm. everyone's like, wow. you're going to tell donors that? Correct. Like, that's wow. an actual activity. You you have to break bread, and then you have to have them at your place. And people are like, okay, I think I get this. But you know who weirdly gets this in the secular? Because we have as many people in the Orthodox world who donate as in the secular world. Here's the secular, and you'll like this, Cyprian. It's the entrepreneur who knows, and I always use the same phrase. I go, okay, so you did something cool with your life. You started, I don't know, a restaurant. You started a software company. Do you remember when you were trying to start it, there was that uncle who like would listen to you, and then he gave you some money to start? That's us. And they're like, so that, that works in Africa? I'm like, yeah, that works. But the problem is, is we got to be their uncle. Like mm-hmm. we have to be trusted. Mm-hmm. We we have to be cared about. And here's the big thing is they have to care for us. Mm-hmm. And I actually mean care. Like they bring our guys. We always, we don't let our guys cook on their own. They will, because they don't always like the food. Some of the food's not so good, but they always, they we want the family to bring them the food because immediately most of these places in Georgia, especially they recognize you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. You can't speak the language. And so you're vulnerable. And in being vulnerable, you create the relationship long-term that allows you to be quote that uncle. If you roll in right off the bat, like you're the uncle, you're, you're, you're just the jerk, Mm -hmm. but you still got the money. This is such, that's how you're perceived. Forgive me. This is an interesting principle. I just wanted to mention get what because it's kicking it off to me is you know the Chuck Chuck Palahniuk I think is his name the author of Fight Club the guy who wrote mm-hmm. Fight Club he wrote another book that became a movie that starred Sam Rockwell and this is kind of like uh, it's called Choke and it's interesting mm-hmm. that you bring this up because even like he was even seeing this principle th- the protagonist of this he's an antihero of course but the protagonist of this. Um, his little scam that he does is he'll go into a restaurant, he'll stuff food down his throat and force himself to start choking and then look for whoever there looks like the wealthiest and get them to save him, to give him the Heimlich. No way. And, no if way. They, and he's like, them saving me? And then from then on, he writes to them telling of his problems and they send him money. They trust Because him. they have that spirit. Because they save, Because they saved his life. He's right. like, oh, no, no, it's much more effective that they save my life mm-hmm. than that I save theirs. So it's just we, a very interesting, it was that, that, we that see just it. immediately went off to be like, whoa, that's deep. <laughs> but in this case, we actually need their help. 
<laughs> like right, that, right, right. We, this is the real. That's the inversion of it. This is the right. real actual thing that he's like. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, one of our field workers just had malaria, and he was being helped by local folks who knew the local remedy. And I always say, take the local remedy. Now we'll we'll use Western medicine too. It's 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 not that hardcore, but I'm like, take the local remedy. The, the, my guess is they know something. Mm-hmm. Um, and then right away when you take the local, I'll give you another example. We just uh, opened a new site in Mozambique, thanks to God. So our two new guys landed there. And um, right away, so one of the hardest things is to get people there to understand what we're doing. It's very hard because they think you're going to stay in the hotel two hours away and drive for a weekend and assess they just not used. So you're going to live in the village. So they always move you to the nicest place in the village. We're like, no, that's not the spot. That's not the spot. And then we finally found the spot. And they were like, no, 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 you can't live there. And I'm looking around and it's actually kind of a nice mud hut, like two rooms and a little kitchenette. And it's, it's, it's pretty good, but they know it as not for the foreigner. And when we finally convinced them right off the bat, they're like, these dudes are weird. Mm. These dudes are weird, but it breaks all the ice like that. And Mm. so do I think it's working? Oh, I know the stories I can tell you guys about what's happening to both people we work with. You can go on our website. We have like 19 projects and each one's our guys report by video of, of how they're, what their plans are to work with this. We call them impresarios. That's either the community or the the local person. And so we have these impresario projects and you can just go see. And and every now and then a donor will just fall in love with one of the projects and will just send money directly to our guys. So we're we're learning ways to fund all of this. But, But I will agree with you guys. The royal path is somehow to avoid the inclination to control. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's not easy. I'll tell you a quick story, how I learned this. If you don't mind, it was in, um, in Mali in West Africa. When I first got started on international development, it was in Peace Corps. And, uh, I was trained in water resource management and then sent to a little village called Sindala about four hours bicycle ride from the capital and no, no white people, no foreigners around. And it was a hard assignment. Even Peace Corps people were like, that's a hard assignment. And good. And immediately I got a little crew together because they were listening to me because I was trained and I was an outsider. And then we started to dig wells and improve the well construction through, you know, engineering tricks that I had been taught. And I would always, these guys would always be like, Joel Gun, hey, be, I don't understand why we're doing this because I can dig a well in like three minutes because the water table was really high, guys. So in that part of Mali, you could just dig a well and it would collapse maybe three months later, but they didn't care because they they could just go dig another one. Mm-hmm. I'd be like, no, no, we're going to lay these bricks. You see these bricks are triangular and they're modular and it's going to be awesome, guys. We're going to lay this apron. They'd be like, <laughs> okay. And they would do it with me. And they'd be like, Okay, and I would go to other villages and they would translate. And eventually the chief comes to me, who I love. He was about 90. He was this skinny, just a teeny little skinny little chief, but he was powerful. And he said, Jomogam, why? That was my name. It was Slave Noise. They had nicknamed me Slave Noise, which is hilarious, right? It's ironic, right? It's it's hilarious. It's actually really funny. That's an old, like, it's like calling someone Ezekiel today. It's like an <laughs> old, old, old bomber name. And they were like, this is the best. So he said, Joe McGon, um, I want to show you something. And he took me, this is six, I had been back there before, but he walked me, he held, it, held my hand like they do in West Africa, walked real slowly. And he says, you see this? And I was like, yeah, this is a crazy old wooden bridge, but huge guys, like, 100 meters and then a span of almost 20 meters that's a big bridge they would and they did it all by chopping down trees that they weren't supposed to chop down and every three or four years they would redo it pad it with mud it was a big project right and he said you see this this is why you've come and i was like no 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 i didn't do bridges i can't engineer a bridge but 
I can work on those wells with you. And he was like, no, all the chiefs and I are talking and you have to do this bridge. And I was like, I, I'm going to get somebody killed. I was a political science major, Cyprian. I, I was like, no, you don't understand. I've come here to do these wells. And I also know how to do mud ovens. Because, see, that was one of the things the government decided the women needed. They were like, we don't want any damn mud ovens. He was cursing. And we don't want any damn, we want this bridge. And you're making an embarrassment out of me. Because you're the foreigner living in my village. And I can't mm. even get you to do this. Mm. I said, Dugu Tiki, chief, I can't do it. And another two months passed, and I kept doing wells. This is a true story, guys. Finally, he comes and takes me, and he says, okay, sit down. And I gave him cola nuts, and we're sitting there. I'm My language, I love language. I'm jamming. He's like, okay, great. It's nice to have you here, but you're going to have to move because you. I'm literally embarrassed, and it's you're looking, making me look really bad. I said, well, what do you want me to do? He goes, I want you to get an engineer or whatever you get in the city and build our bridge. So I was going to get kicked out of the village, but I loved it there. And these people were good to me. They were my friends. So I went to a French agency. Well, first thing I did is I went to Peace Corps. They were like, I don't know. We don't have any engineers for that. Then I got on my motorcycle and I went to the, the Peace Corps center and I found this kid, Omar, who's 21 years old, just out of MIT and just landed. He was a brand new. He couldn't speak a lick of nothing. I said, Omar, come with me. I took him on my motorcycle. This is a true story. Drove him out. I said, survey this for me. Already I'm breaking the rules. I'd have gotten in trouble. He did some half-assed surveying of the, he's just an engineer guy, but he's smart. And he's like, well, and he drew it like a black and white of what the bridge could look like. I took it, went to this French agency. They gave me $28,000 in 1992. That's a lot of dough. And then somehow I got rented trucks. It's like insane. I didn't know what I was doing. I got They got their mason to be the engineer on it. He couldn't read or write, guys. I brought all this stuff up in two trucks. There was a huge parade of kids like, Joe Manga, Joe Manga. These <laughs> trucks, they come out, they build a separate mud like warehouse. We put everything in there. Hundred guys came out for almost six months free because the 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 chiefs made them. They came out before they would go to, to the fields. And there was a bridge. And I brought my wife back to it seven years later. And I said, we built this. When I got back, they were like, this guy. And here's what happened. I did something I could do. Mm -hmm. Right? I just did what I could do. Mm -hmm. And then they had what they needed. And that's really the foundational story for our whole, all of our work, which is do what you can do and stop trying to get them to do what you want them to do. Mm -hmm respond you don't have to be in control and so that's what we're trying to do man but that changed my life though father that 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 was much more than a bridge project that was a growing up to be a man project what's kind of interesting thing. is that the elder the chief he knew full well he knew full well that what he was that what he was asking of you was not unreasonable that he, you could absolutely do it he knew full well and you were just saying no I You're was afraid. Like, no. mm -hmm. Well, when you when you when you when you hang cement so trucks can drive over, you you don't. That seems dangerous, like to me. You know, don't get me wrong, guys. It's not the massivest bridge ever. It's it's a kind you drive over and you realize, oh, that's a bridge. But you're not. It's not out. It's not the Empire State. I mean, it's not the Golden Gate Bridge. But the point is, is yeah, he knew. But I did. I wasn't trained. And this is like, you know, Cyprian, you're an entrepreneur. The entrepreneur says, and now I think I've become that person, is, well, what can I do? Let's let's do the thing we can do now. Did he freeze? I think so. Oh, it's not it's not me? Father, are you there? No, it's not you. Okay, he froze. For the first time ever. For the first time ever. <laughs> as I'm recording you. in Saipan. Let's see. Let's see if he comes back. Let's see if he comes back. No. Oh, there he is. There he is. I came back. I sorry. That was my frozen. connection. It's all good. It's a, for the first time. It wasn't me. I was a little worried today because uh, the Saipan Internet, it, anything can happen. We've had one of the things we've had go on during the show. We've had island wide power outages. We've had a, uh, a bamboo <laughs> tree that blew up the transformer next to my house it leaned into the wire and blew it up um Yikes. with the with the bird on it 
with the bird <laughs> sitting on it. And my wife had just pulled her car up and uh and she said i just saw a bird explode and now <laughs> <laughs> and now the, ba the bamboo tree is on fire now and the lightning that one on time that lightning strike La we ha i had a lightning strike hit right in front of us when when uh, andrew was talking about thor which was <laughs> weird is like, that true right in, yeah andrew's talking about thor and right in front of me goes Control! <laughs> the lightning just comes down and hits right in front of me. It's, we, it's the it's the weirdest two hours on Saipan, I think. But I think I know why. I think I know why. It's it's interesting the the this dynamic that you're talking about, John. Because I mean, on a on a much on a much smaller level, but this same sort of principle has certainly played out in the time that I've been here in Saipan. Because when I came out here. One of the reasons why I even found out about this place was because uh, a, a guy who's a, a become a friend now, but he had come and wanted to start like a little intentional crypto community kind of. And he mm -hmm. had these these ideas about how and his ideas about, you know, what they need to do here to be better, meaning more efficient at what they do, mm -hmm. more productive in the way that he wanted to see them productive, all of these sorts of things. Now, mind you. The people who are here, the Chamorros and Carolinians, not the Carolinians have been here 200 years, but the Chamorros have been here for 3000 years. Wow. Right. Like this, it's like one of the it's a very old and like the families that have been here, their blood has been here for a very, very, very long time. Right. Yeah. And and I showed up and I saw a lot of the things that that, you know, he had mentioned in terms of inefficiencies and stuff. And I was judging it against sort of mainland and the things that I knew. Like, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you an example. Um, I first got here and it was like, okay, go shopping, go grocery shopping, right? Now, mind you, it's under an American flag. You know, you've got all the sort of things kind of that you think that are, are there, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, but to, to find, you know, all the things that I needed for grocery shopping, like I probably got to go to three, four stores. And I was thinking, wow, wouldn't it be, you know, if we could, if, if somebody yes, just made there goes like your a, brain, your yeah, brain if started just made like a site where, uh, you know, you could like catalog all the things and just like kind of say where all the things were. And then you could either plan it out or put them all in one place. And like, and then, it's, and I started describing it to people and people were like, mm, no, you just go to three or four stores. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, no, 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 no. But it, it'd be, it'd be much. We got this. This, this is very early, this. right? And it was like, no, 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 no. But and as I've been here, now I look back and I'm like, no, you totally go to three or four stores because one of the things that you end up doing is you end up traveling around the island, and invariably you run into people. Like it's there's only fifty thousand people in the Commonwealth. Gee. Right. See. So you invariably run into people and it's like, oh, well, this is also my social life as well. I catch up on things. I find out, oh, I get invited to a dinner over here. I get this and that. I run into friends. Oh, what are you doing? And, and it's like, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. You go to mm -hmm. three or four. Like, that's one of the blessings of well, being in a small But you know community. what? This is, forgive me. This is just, it's the same thing that happens for, I think, some people who will come in to like, let's say a service because their daughter or their cousin or their friend is getting baptized or something, but they have no context for the church. And they're like, they can kind of get it. Cause it's, you know, there's obvious, there's things that, that strike an obvious chord of quote unquote mm -hmm. beauty and it's mm -hmm. exotic, but I could, I've had these conversations with people. It's like, well, like, why are you doing this or that? It's like, it's, it's not an efficient way to do church. You know what I mean? Ah, that's right. And and since it's not an efficient way to do church, it's kind of like, oh, that's great. But like, or, or even again, getting back to, you know, our context here, it's like, well, that's really great. You're doing that. Have you thought about, you know, kind of doing fill in the blank, obvious thing that you should do if you're in a poor black neighborhood? Oh, I like, think about that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, I'm not, I don't want to do that right. because Number one, I've already done that, and I know it doesn't work. That's the first thing. But number two, that just kind of takes you out of this place of just living life as you're supposed to live. Because there's this, in that case that Cyprian you described, there's a disguised value system. Well, it's disguised to you. Yes, that's you exactly right. You can't see right. it. 
that <laughs> communion was a higher value mm -hmm. and efficiency. Mm -hmm. But we don't realize we value efficiency above almost all comfort mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. And so we keep, tr we think we're helping, but we're just trying to, we're trying to change the value system. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Maybe that's good. It, it, it really, I, I'm always telling the guys, it depends, right? Like mm -hmm. some value systems aren't good just because they're theirs, but often we don't know what they are. We don't see them. Well, the thing is too, it's almost like finding that place in which you can actually participate or actually help. So in other words, like, okay, we, we value efficiency because we're consumers. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But there could be a place if you reorientate your, your value system, your value hierarchy and say efficiency is good if it serves the deeper things. Oh, exactly. Right? Like, we don't because because we as Westerners want efficiency for efficiency's sake. It's efficiency is good in of itself, but if it's right. like, well, if, if I can make something efficient so that we can have more time for communion, so that we can have more time to be That's with, awesome. so we can have more time, That's you know, awesome. it, then let then let's do that. Then let's do that. I think an efficient thing that i love is the little coal that burns in the incense and it just lights right up yep. because mm -hmm. now i can have more incense during liturgy right but if i was using that for i don't know smoking some heroin it's probably not great <laughs> that that's, that's right. an efficient thing that's right. well, the, well this same the same individual here i remember having a conversation the one the one who really valued the you know showing them how to do how to do it much better i remember having a conversation because one of the things that I value here is there are no um, like consume like mainland consumer American brands here, like stores. Like there's no, we don't have any of the national banks. No Chase, hmm. no Bank of America, no Wells Fargo. We have none of the big box stores, Home Depot, Target, any of those things. We have none of the big grocery chains. We don't even have any of the mobile phone carriers. We have IT wow. and E and Docomo Pacific, right? All of the banks are locally chartered here. Every single store is like a local small shop. That's why you got to go to so many, right? We have like um, two McDonald's franchised, right? A Subway, a Pizza Hut. Like that's as, bi that's as big as it gets. A franchised Ace Hardware. I think there's two of them, right? And that's it. And I remember having a conversation and he was like, yeah, but if they just had a Target here, or a home or a, or a Walmart, you know, they could just put a Walmart and it would be like, you could go, you could get everything and think about how much more productive people could be in the whole nine. And I was like the trade off though. Why the do you think they're not there? Cyprian, what, the, it's the, the, the it's, bigger name. So it's the culture. That's what's so interesting. Yeah. I don't think is, they've been trained yet. Well, it's not, no, no, they, they actively fight it. Okay. So so everyone here who has political, this is one of the weirdest things about like being under an American flag and like there's zero white people with any political or or legal mm. enforcement power here. So like every single person who has either a gun or the capability to uh, make a law or put somebody in jail is a, is a local. It's, it's, it's Chamorro or Carolinian, period, period. Not Filipino, not Chinese, not because it's 40% Filipino here, right? Zero political power, any of that. And so it's like, well, who would target displace? Well, it would displace a Chamorro company mm. that's here. And it's I like, see. well, the owner of that company is the cousin of the governor. And mm. every single regulator and legislator and judge mm. is, within, is within two degrees of separation familially right and so it's like no 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 no. you can't come here so there's an awareness of their cultural foundations mm -hmm. and and it's, and they're it's, and they protect it in their constitution nobody but locals yeah. can own land here so i'll speak for west i can speak for well let's talk about georgia for a second yeah, let's. they're in a battle right now or a, they're in this struggle right now um and basically the struggle is, is to what degree will Georgians invest in the Western dream versus mm -hmm. the Russian dream? Now, what I want everybody to know is listening is neither one of those are Georgian. The, the, 
many of us Orthodox know about Georgia and we're like, oh, what a, it's a quaint, beautiful, old fashioned Orthodox place, which it is. But the two visions constantly presented to them are Russian Imperial and slash Soviet Imperial, or whatever you want to call it. And then the Western dream of a free market. But the Georgians have not, I, I call it turned over yet. They, they're, they're right in the middle of trying to decide who they are. That's where the church steps in. It's really fascinating. Right now in West Africa, the culture is breaking down. And one of the reasons it's breaking down is because the powers that be the the chiefs, they're always offered, and this happened in Nigeria, they're always offered big money from big companies to come in and do things that need to be done. So there's this constant debate about how Mende they stay. And I think they won't stay very Mende for very for very much longer. There's there's a lot of Chinese movement in, in West Africa right now to sell the big Chinese companies, especially the big um, the big uh, manufacturing companies. It's it's wild. It's a new kind of colonialism. It sounds like Saip- it's Saipan, right? Yep. They, yep. They're they're holding out or something. Trying, trying, but it's. I think it's easier to do when you're on a smaller scale. Right. Yeah. You, you can hold out, I think, on a smaller scale because it's divide and conquer at the end of the day. Right. And I, and, I yeah. root for the old world man to win. But, you know, it's like the spiritual life on some level. Aren't we all fathers sort of we're tempted into variations on 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 goodness all the time. We're yeah. trying to hold on to our tradition. For sure. I mean, it, it, you guys are t- I've just been kind of mulling over my mind right now this thing of globalization because we say that and I think we have um we just have our kind of own projection of, of what that is and that it's always the the western model of something taking over the little guy but it's not because when you brought up China and China moving into Africa and that reality that's not the west no, no, that's not the West, but it is a type of globalization that is subsuming, you know, the kind of, if you will, like uh, the culture or the personhood yeah. um, of 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 a, of a nation. And I find it I find it really fascinating because, in some regard, um, you know, I've always seen, you know, I, I learned this personally. You know, one of the one of the ways I can tell, besides the sting of the sacrifice of giving alms, is is am I getting a sense of the person I'm I'm with? Hmm. You know what I mean. And if that's lost due to the 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 weight of my gift, something's wrong. You know what I mean. Hmm. And and I think that's that's a really interesting thing to think about. And I, I don't mean the same way we were talking about earlier, but kind of scaled up in regards of helping a village or helping a people. Mm-hmm. It's like, are they getting lost, subsumed in the shadow of, of my gift and my sacrifice? Right. You know what I mean? Or is their push or is their person is their personhood, the personhood of them as a people, is it is it is it coming out? Because I think that's one of the things when you when you see how Christ interacts with people um their personhood is never lost if anything right. brought forward even when it's even when it's painful for instance like the, the rich young ruler like his personhood and who he was was brought forward in a very uncomfortable way for him right but he did that for mary magdalene he did it for the 10 lepers you know only one came back you know what i mean it's like he whenever there is this encounter I mean, that's what it means to be with Christ is this personal encounter. And wow, that's so intense. You're right. Something's being drawn out. It's not mm-hmm. being covered over. That's mm-hmm. interesting. Mm-hmm. It's and not being that's, replaced. Well, I think, I think honestly, John, it, it's one of the things that I really at the core find fascinating about what you're doing is that it, it is. And I don't know, it's not necessarily explicit, but to me, what is definitely implicit uh, is this awareness of that is ultimately what's going to happen? Is there's a drawing out that's going to occur? See, that's so beautiful. And you know what? It's a thing. I don't know how to explain this. 
I don't want to toot our own horn, but it's a thing and it's, it's a synergy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we haven't done that many. We're, we're really six years in the making. And for the first year, we didn't have any projects because we did it our way. We waited and waited and then we got some. But when you look at the the communion that takes place between our guys, for instance, Juno and in Guatemala and his projects, he really feels connected to what those guys have, who they are and who they're becoming. He's so excited for what the impresarios are becoming. Not because they're becoming like him. It's because he sees in them like this hope and desire. And even though the projects aren't always, you know, huge, he sees that it's made a difference. Here's a question. Here's a narrative about black folks. I want to ask this question because you're in the, the, you know, father, you're, 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 you're in the ministry and black folks are a type of cultural entity. Mm -hmm. I have friends who argue that what's happened with black folks in America is that they have refused. They are the Saipan who, who they imported a whole series of African values and have managed, or, you know, that sounds crazy. It sounds like they're doing it on purpose, but they've managed to not imbibe all of that, which they see as Western. And that's why they remain quote poor. Mm-hmm. I have heard that narrative from black folks, folks that I super respect. I don't know if it's true, but I don't know if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is this is great. You know, I, I don't I don't know if it's true. And I'll tell you why. Number one, I don't know if it's true because of my ignorance. I've never I haven't stepped foot on the, the great continent of Africa. Right, um, right. The, the Africans I have known have been predominantly Eritrean and Ethiopian, mm-hmm. right? So it's a very small segment of a very vast multicultural continent, right? Yeah, that's the problem. And that's, and that's exactly. already very different culturally than the West Africans who came via, via right. slavery. Right, totally yeah. different. And, sure. and, totally and different. obviously, surprise, surprise, it's because there's a shared, you know, um, religious ecclesiastical tradition, you know, Yes. To some degree. Right. So so it's like that's that's really enlarged my experience on, outside of, you know, I've talked about this before, but. Um, outside of the Eritreans and Ethiopians, I've known um, because, you know, being in the Orthodox you know, church here in America, um, I've had kind of negative experiences in the sense that Africans have generally not wanted to have anything to do with me. I know this is as, another very interesting, you know, as, as an African-American, then on top of that, you know, I'm heavily tattooed. So it's kind of like already like that's a no go. So, so that being said, when I hear, I've heard this narrative before too. And like, because of this context, I just threw out both Africans kind of like not liking me and then knowing lots of Ethiopians and Eritreans. Um, or them being the ones, I, that culture being the one I've had the most intimate experience with, I don't see it. You know, I really yeah. don't see what these values are. What I see is um, I see poor, <laughs> uh, I see poor Highlander culture from the South. That's wow. That's insightful. Right? That's, I mean, you know, and, and again, like, Yep. That's that's right. You, soul, see, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's like uh, what is a black rednecks, right? Black yeah. rednecks and, and and white liberals, you know, uh, or black, uh, yeah, black rednecks, white liberals. Like that's that's what I've seen. That's what I encountered. And um, yeah, that that because again is you know this thought of like oh these are African um, values. I are they? You know what I mean? Like are yeah. they? Because. You know, I, I think I, here's one thing that I, that I also know, though, is that um, in the, in the real absence of of knowing history, um, you know, nature pours a vacuum. So that absence of history has caused a lot of quote unquote black folks to want to to feel the need to um, fill that gap with the their the kind blanks. of understanding. Yeah. But that's where you get a lot of these things where it's I mean. You get all these movements where it's like, we're you know, we're Egyptian or we're Jewish or we're, we're anything Correct. but what yeah. we are, right? And yeah. and 
I think that's for me, that's one of the most liberating, that's one of the biggest liberating things that have ever happened to me coming in Orthodox church was just accepting everything. Not, not only accepting the not knowing, but even accepting those aspects that like I for a long time deemed as shameful or whatever, and actually, right. actually be like, oh, this is actually um, profound, you know, drawing strength from those things that, that were shameful. Now, that being said, that being said, I will say this in regards of kind of getting back to your question, like not wanting to participate or like saying no, like uh, this, you're kind of making this analogy of like, are, are you know, African-Americans analogous? And again, African, because we're not talking about Nigerians or whatever. Um, right, right. So I, I just don't want to say like kind of general black people, but like African-American folks, like, are they, you know, just is that their kind of way of saying no? It's like, like no to the machine or yeah, something. Yeah, like no, because... Because yeah, African Americans, yeah. like the the reason why the African American culture is so busted the way it is, is because it's an, it's it's totally embraced the machine. That's how I see it. it. It's totally embraced the machine in regards of the the very material, the materialism, like the the <laughs> the materialism in regards of finding value in what you can have who you can do and like that now again not to make a blanket statement that's not all of african-american culture because that's yeah. part of the problem is it's presented as a very narrow myopic ones and and it, what's sad is a lot of black folk fall for that they think that like oh you know like oh this is just how it is and it's like man you're you're you are programmed by the record industry and, you know, at the time MTV, now the internet, just as much as anybody else is, when you have forgotten that you're, you come from a culture, even if it's a young culture and a young history, which is way more rich, way more dignified than, than what you're experiencing now. You know what I mean? Uh, um, this, this, was, this was a big, I, have a, I, I think I have a unique view on when this narrative began, right? When this, when this, and and where the shift happened because i mean i was at howard university in the mid 90s okay. and i feel like this was you because you had the old the old sort of mindset of what howard was and then i think probably what you would encounter more if you were there now which is i i would say i would say and and maybe this is part of the beginning of the things that turn into BLM and woke stuff and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And it really was a divergence between wh where I saw the, the biggest divergence was the students who came from the South and the students who came from the North. So like DC and above had this new narrative, right? And this new narrative of, of, of like pejoratively that would be called like we was Kangs, right? Mm -hmm. Like this, Mm -hmm. This new thing, and it was new. Mm -hmm. And the the students that came from the South embodied like who had been going to the HBCUs mm -hmm. the whole time, That's and right, like man. church on Sunday. Like on mm -hmm. Sunday, the kids the the kids from New York would be waking up, hungover. You know what yep. I mean? Doing yep. whatever. Yep. And again, programmed by MTV and the whole nine. And the kids from the South would all be dressed up and going to church. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And the, and what they embraced, and there was a rebellion. Yeah. What I saw was like the kids from the North, there was a rebellion, right? It wasn't, oh, I'm here to embody what they would call like the Howard man or the Howard woman. There was this idea of the Howard man or the Howard woman. And it was that ideal was almost like you're even more a, a better exemplar of the virtue of the West and not the vice. I see. So it wow. was like, this is from where the, the fraternities were initially born. I mean, Omega Sci-Fi, like the biggest, mm -hmm. most powerful black fraternity, the alpha chapter is there at Howard, right? And it was like this idea that like, no, 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 we're, we're going to embody the highest virtues of American culture. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what you're here to do and here to embrace. But this yeah. rebellion came in that like, no, 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 no. We're African. We're... It, Hebrew Israelites. We're from mm -hmm. this place. We're from this place. We're from this way. Reject that. Mm -hmm. Reject that. 
reject you know, that out out and out and it's like that to me i feel like that's the there was this decline because that other thing is not there in the black community anymore yeah it just really yeah i is. like what, what father said well, it's the black narrative is i think exemplified by extremes mm-hmm. and it goes up and down and up and down and uh so i as you guys know i'm i married a black woman grew up on 164th street in the bronx outside of Yankee Stadium, Andrews Avenue, right there. And um, I thought I was cool, that dude. And then we fell in love or whatever. Not really. She sent me away. Long story <laughs> short, father, that, that's a fact. I got to Georgia because she was like, yeah, I'm not I'm not dating a white dude. That's not happening. But anyway, long story short, while I was in Georgia, she, she had started going to Orthodox Church. She got baptized. We came back. And as I mentioned earlier, we went on uh, our honeymoon a year after our marriage to that village I told you guys about, to Sindala in West Africa. So she, when I met her, she was starting to, you know, wear her her kente cloth. And long story short, when we got to West Africa, there was no romance in that. It was what you were saying, Father. That there was no we was Kangs. Okay, uh-huh. it wasn't. That was not the. What the people that I knew, and even as we drove, we went all the way down to Ghana, we went along the coast. Everyone had the same take, which was basically, and I, I was translating, so I know this. They would be like, yeah, because you, you'd say, like, well, so what, do you, what am I to you? It was fascinating, right? And they would go, well, nah, maybe Fula, because the Fula are lighter skin, um, but you, you just got sold. The strength yeah. you That's got sold, and, she, <laughs> and she'd be like, "Well, well, what do you mean?" She goes, "You were probably from one of the inland communities that got sold because you got you got taken and then sold." She he said, well, "I knew people from our, you know, from the bomber that got sold. Maybe you're a bomber." There was no romance mm-hmm. in it. Mm-hmm. The, it was, and she would say, "So then, what am I?" She goes, "I." They would just be like. I don't know, but you're not one of us. Mm-hmm. And she was in this netherland. And but of course, for her it was no problem because she had already become Orthodox. And so mm-hmm. there was already a there, there. There was there was and, and that is important what you said, Father. History does matter. And it, it's not to be forgotten that that was stripped away from people. That's a that's a terrible thing. Um, in terms of you know, but, just but, worldly but what context. I, what, but what I will say, and I mean I think that this is this is going back to to this difference that I saw is like, we do have a history though, as black right. people here. Like, I, th- right. I think that that's, that's really the, right. is that Good it's point. like, even if we just start the history at slavery, right. that's enough. As right. a matter of fact, it's more than enough. That's right. It's that's more right. than enough. Like if we would simply embrace that. And it, in right. some ways it's like not jumping over saints. That's right? right. It's like it's like not not hopscotch because over saints how, to get to the ancient saints. Because how do you let's it's two things, right? It's not playing leapfrog, right? Um, it's being well, it's multiple things, not playing leapfrog, it's being honest, right? Because honesty is the on-ramp to getting to the truth. You know what I mean? And you shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free. Truth is a person. And what I one of the things that it doesn't really matter and almost makes the point more if you want to get into, you know, the bad moral, the, the moral failings of like, let's say Martin Luther King and the moral failings of a lot of the civil rights movement. It's almost better. It's almost better for, for, for the case I'm trying to make right now, which is something powerful still happened during that period of time in regards of the movement of African-American folk and dignity and, and trying to, really not want vengeance, not what, but on the one hand, call quote unquote white America to repentance, quote unquote, to try to um, live an authentic American life in the sense of wanting dignity and happiness, all that stuff. It's it's stuff that everyone knows, but I'll just say this, but the problem is, is that if you begin to shift, and this is the problem with any type of historical uh, revisionism, is that when you shift a narrative from something that was unpleasant but true into something that's palatable but false, you will always end up with the monster, always. 
because it's it's not intended. It may be okay for a while. It's like this. It's the person who gets their hair permed forever and then it starts to fall out. Hmm. You know what I mean, hmm. it, it, you're, 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 it's not meant, your hair is not meant to be permed forever all the time. You're going, it's going to, sure, every once in a while, whatever, it, you're going to suffer consequences. And so that loss of authenticity, which is, that's the kind of tragedy of it. That's the pathway to finding who you're supposed to be, because it's very much so, you know, it's, yes. well, one of the things I love about what you do too, John, is like Watar and all that stuff. And the, just the, yeah. the, the, the core thing of old world versus new world. And on the one hand, the Afrofuturist narrative, I love in the sense of what it could have been, but I've abandoned it because that movement of what that future should have been has been corrupted because that old world perspective on things, that's what could have really, and still can, I don't want to be, not, I don't want to be fatalistic, but that's what's missing from the African-American. And any, that's what's going to be missing from any um, experience of a people, of an ethnos. Because the old world is this, finding who you're meant to be in God. The okay. New, the new world is make yourself however you want to be, right? But you don't know. You know what I mean? You you it, it's fundamentally autonomous. It's fundamentally hyper individualistic without this kind of synergy. You know what I'm saying? Let me push back, please. For, for, uh, okay, but I I don't think it's a full push. Back. I think I agree with you. I think. Let me ask you this, Father and Supreme. You're describing something like a spiritual athleticism that's like akin to like the NBA as compared to my playing on the street or something. You're talking about the opportunity for black folks in the new world to have assumed something like a role that could call out right all the things going on around them, which is what King did and, and to his credit. And I think that is the high spiritual bar that all of us are called to every single one of us is called to leave sort of blood behind. But I will say one thing about the old world for better or worse. And everyone will, I think, agree with me who's, who's lived in it at any length of time. You are known by your name. So when I walk into a village, they, even as a white man, they ask me, which is what is your last name? And as soon as I say, nay, camera, then they say, Kamara. Kamara is the last name. Kamara, how's your father? Because I know your father. How's your mother? How's your sister? How's your brother? And there's a litany that goes back and forth. You see this all across Africa. You see it in Georgia, too. Everyone is oh, known by that name. They do it here, John. Forgive me. They do it here. There's they only do like there. 12 last names here. <laughs> now, where we don't do that is in America. The first name is is it has eclipsed the last name. That's, that special identity has eclipsed the family, familial identity. So what do I think? I think you're right, Father. I think there is a, a type of incredible spiritual invitation to people who had lost their last name. But in losing your last name, that is difficult. Okay, that is a, that is a, that is a crisis of identity. Because my wife's name is Cooper, but that is not, that was the slave master's name. Mm-hmm. And so we can we can say that that's not much but as an old world guy who watches that that's a lot now i don't know my last name i can't go back two generations it doesn't mean anything i don't even know dutch german or something i'm with you it's 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 mediated through the new world but man i think but see i think i think that's the thing though is like saint eustace lost his wife his two you know his sons I mean, and the reason why he's such an, you know, just such a gnarly saint is because he went through that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's but right. Like, I so, agree with that. So, yeah. so, so I think that's the thing is that, and here's the other part that's problematic is it isn't just hypothetical, right? Because up until the civil rights movement, that's what black folk did. I mean, you know, Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver, you know what I mean? I mean, heck. So you're in her truth, you know what I mean? Heck, I mean, we can just keep going on and on in regards of that embracing of that suffering 
and 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 not turning it into vengeance, but rather that that Christ like em, embracing. Right. That that's why it's such a damning testimony, and I think that's to some degree why these influences. Um, you know, there are principalities at play mm. that have that have sought to influence uh, African Americans for various reasons, mm-hmm. have implanted a false narrative to get to 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 fundamentally play on the passions. You know, it says in Proverbs that um well, how how's it say? It says uh uh sin, oh gosh, I had it right here. It's a uh, Righteousness is exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And righteousness is very seldomly revealed in pleasantries, mm-hmm. very seldom. Mm-hmm. And I would even say it never is in a true Christian context. The servant is above the master. So when we see a saint who's like, oh, and he lived long to old age, but it's it's not super rare, but it's rare enough. But it it is never separate from a life of um, suffering. So in the, so what I'm saying is, even if even if a saint lives to an old age, they still suffered. That's mm-hmm. that's the cross, right? And I think that's the thing is, every movement has sought to pull African Americans and now European Americans, everyone. It's, it's seeking to pull everybody, getting back to the globalization, that spirit of the age, yeah. is seeking to pull everyone, black, white, brown, yellow, rainbow. Well, excuse me. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I just flew out. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's trying to pull them away from away from the cross. But it's actually in the cross where that righteousness is going to be found. And again, it was up until, you know, um, it was up until the the kind of seduction of well we don't need to, we don't need to do that. And I, think, I would say I would say forgive me you know again this is I've said this before a bunch of times but that's the thing about the Serbs is you know for the, I mean gosh five hundred years under the Turks you know what I mean and and the real it. I was just gonna bring this up. There's every opportunity to lose identity there, but that something was going on, right? Something, mm-hmm. some spiritual value was being just embraced. And and I would say this, I was just talking about this um, with uh, Filaret, uh, at the, we just came back from um, our diocese, diocesan meeting, and we were talking um, with a young Serbian guy about George Washington Carver, because we have, you know, the farm here, George Washington Carver Farm. And we're talking about how, you know, I was like, oh, you know, he's like the Maximus. He's like the African-American Maximus, like of the peanut. You know what I mean? The, the logo of the peanut. Because like, what's the essence of the peanut, right? That's and even, and really even in the way of like, you hear his. That's hot. You hear how he talks about, you know, hearing from the plants, you know, listening to the, to the flowers and then asking, speaking to God and all this stuff. And it's like, it's one of those things where he could not have been Orthodox because there was literally no context right. for him to encounter orthodoxy, but you see, you know, saints known and unknown. You see a holiness that's developing within that man because there's this, there's this a devotion to Christ as best as he understood Christ, this devotion to God as best as he understood God. But these characteristics that line up with the experience of, of our saints. Now, I'm not going too far, but what I'm trying to say is, why is that? Because there was an there was a Christ-like understanding of embracing that cross, not being ashamed of it, not running from it, That's right. and, and 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 not not being a coward either. Because cow, there's a there's a cowardliness that comes. It, it goes both ways. You can be a coward by running from your cross, and you can also be a coward by not manfully carrying the cross too. If, mm-hmm. if you get what I'm saying, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? And so I think you have these these incredible people who they may not have died in the church, but if that cultural seed that they had planted had been nurtured and sustained, I mean, I have no doubt because I feel like I'm an inheritor of that culture. I feel like Cyprian's an inheritor of that culture. And that's part, that seedbed 
it's part of what has allowed orthodoxy to take such deep root in us in a different way mm-hmm. because that narrative of like suffering is salvific and it does produce if if you if you approach the suffering and the shame of your life honestly without mm-hmm. trying to twist the narrative this is out it. of ego this is gorgeous mm-hmm. yeah this boom is it. you will it's like you'll find this Christ. is it this is it you'll find christ you know I want to oh, so see... circle back. Hold, hold I'm, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Forgive me. Because I no, feel like ahead. this is the, the perfect time to circle back because it really struck me when you were talking about scale and like this idea of, oh, that doesn't scale. Because I feel like what we're talking about here is how like the truth actually does scale is that, no, it actually scales better than whatever your efficient system that you wanted to do. It's like, no, no, no. Like living in, in the example And then people seeing it, like it's organic. Oh, yeah, it's Mm. it scales to everybody who can see you behaving that way. Right. And I think that it's like in in some ways, that's the missed opportunity, perhaps, of black America since the civil rights movement is that it's like the examples, because if we look at, well, who are the examples or the heroes that we would look to in all of those cases, like it can't scale. Everybody in the civil rights movement, you looked as an example and it's like, oh, yeah, that scales because I can I can be out there marching. I could suffer. I could have the dogs bite me. Right. I could be sprayed with a fire hose. But like I can't play in the NBA. Mm-hmm. I can't I can't become a millionaire rapper. Right. Mm-hmm. I can uh, name the things. Right. And I see what I you're saying. Wow. That's that. fascinating. Right. That's and what, so in that's some ways, lacking. in some ways, you both are saying. I hear this, that there is a missed opportunity in the suffering. And instead, there's been a type of sellout to uh, a cheaper version of the cross. Or it's not even the cross. It's really just the machine. It's It's Antichrist. Antichrist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Antichrist. And so maybe, by the way, that's also the narrative of the the meaner sort, Scots Irish who ran to the hills. It's really the narrative of almost... It's the West at this point, mm-hmm. and 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 maybe the black fo- black folks who are already quote on the bottom, maybe they're suffering the worst from the this this apostasy of the West. Well, but and a belief and a belief that they're and a constant being told that there is no salvation at the bottom. Mm-hmm. That, well, because the bottom is the worst place to be. Exactly. That it's, that it's and that there's nothing redeemable from being at the. But bottom. That ties into this notion of service too. Which yeah, is which, to 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 be at the bottom is to be essentially well. The Son of Man yeah. came to serve and yeah. not be served. But but I'll even go even a step further. It's kind of like you know with this thing wow. of this is very fascinating because it's intense. Some people have tried to run with this, and but they the problem is is they they've ran with it with too much of a, a kind of a racial lens. But I I. I really think, though, that you can really kind of focus this in and and it can be very much a kind of revelatory tool for everyone, right? So in the same way of like an icon, like an icon, not there is only one Seraphim Sarab, but his icon reveals so much about you and about everyone. You see what I'm saying? Mm. So when you look at African American folk you can really examine I mean a lot of the failures of the west and and those failures come from you know all the things that are antithetical to orthodox spirituality not to western christianity quite the opposite Right. Part of the problem is that, you know, the the Christianity that that black folk, African-Americans like globbed on to was not the Christianity that was given to them by the slave masters. It was very different. Right. It, it was very different. So what was it that they globbed on to and what they globbed on to was very much more an orthodox ethos. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. But the problem is when people hear, see, people get stuck on this because they have too much of an external understanding of orthodoxy. That's the first thing, right? 
where there is these dichotomies of or they see orthodoxy exclusively as the externals, mm -hmm. not just of the ethnic aspect of it, but even the externals of how, to give you an example, what is salvific? Is it the canon that prescribes the penance or is it the fruit of the penance that was brought by the canon? You see what I'm saying? So yeah, like absolutely. applying the canon as just like a dry thing, it's like you'll kill people. You know right. what I mean? So in this way, if we kind of dial in and you can look and see like, okay, well, number one, what happens a narrative that a lot of black folk hear in this, in the again, you know, oh, not just like white Jesus, but like, oh, this kind of like, you know, Bob Marley, you know, um, <clears throat> pie in the sky, forget that, all that stuff, right? Well, that narrative is a false narrative, right? It is a false narrative that the West gives. Now, the, now the truth of the Orthodox experience is this. Um, yes, your rewards are in, in heaven, but you do begin to experience them here and now. That's right. But the problem that people get mis mixed up on is, well, what are you supposed to experience, right? And so I would just point to, let's say, monasticism, right? So if you look at monasticism and you see, like, what is the core of monasticism? It's like, um, uh, I think it was, uh, there was an Abba who came and said to another Abba, he says, you know, what is what is the essence of monasticism? And he basically grabs his hat you know, his, 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 uh, his scoofy and he throws it on the ground and stops, starts stomping on. He says, unless someone is able to, to be treated like, like this hat, they don't know what monasticism is. Right. You hear that. You're like, what in the world? Like all the desert fathers, all this crazy, radical, extreme humility, which is an imitation of our master, right? This radical, extreme humility and this being able to die to yourself into the world this is something that predates transatlantic slave trade. It That's predates right. civil That's rights. Right. It predates America. It predates the West, right? That spirituality is, it is, period, right? And that's something that was a missed, and it is, because we can't go back to it. It was a missed opportunity. That's right. That that I think that's 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 something to really kind of highlight because, you can see that path being laid to where, you know, not that, you know, multiverses are a thing, but if they were, you could see a reality where eventually, kind of like they're doing like some places like in Uganda where they're discovering orthodoxy at large because they've just kind of embraced this thing that is very Christ, a very Christ-like ethos already. And I, I, I you see that in the early history African-Americans. And I think you see that in the history of anyone who has been willing to suffer That's right. because they, they've had a vision and a hope for something greater, not just like, oh, we'll get out of it one day, like the children of Israel, right? Because there's a portion of that, which is there, right? But something in the shadow of Christ where it's like, I this this kind of being broken and poured out, something is revealed and you experience something of the etern of, of eternity. But right? this sounds like what first things is doing though. Like you're saying this, <laughs> and I feel like this is what this is what um like John, it feels like when you described what the people participating in your program are forced to do, it feels like this is like inserting them into that. Well, if if we can go with the same, I don't know, we'll connect the metaphor, right? It, to bow is to be brought high. And so black folks were an icon and an image on those ships of those who were made to bow. And then they were they were an offering to the United States in many ways to return to what they should have already been. And mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying, Father. In other words, they were the field worker down, 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 and offering a chance to all of us right to participate in the humility right and to be brought to something like a true christianity and now i think what i hear you guys saying is is that the black community has instead taken the bait and tried to uh actually become well, everybody, one with everybody the machine. has yeah, everybody, everybody has, everybody. Everybody has. I, I, yeah. I think that that's the that it's like it wasn't 
it's not like like a single group grabbed it right and I, and you know when you see this because like i'm half black and half mexican right and grew up in california and and my and my mother you know like her her whole mission and her outreach and all her students and everything most of them were immigrants and people are like it's it's in those communities but it's immigrant communities everywhere that come into the west probably weirdly less even but, less so now but like it's this idea of oh they'll do the jobs and do the things that the people here won't do and mm -hmm. it's this idea of like we're talking about the bottom well yeah there's nobody i mean even homeless american citizens are generally better off than yeah. the guy who comes with nothing and comes across the desert into the united states and is like not, homeless Absolutely. But then it's like, wait a minute. But how is it that 20 years later, that guy owns a house, has his kids going to college? It's like, wait a minute. How did that happen? How did that? And it's like, and I think that it is that taking the bait. He came to suffer. There was no question of it with it with him. Well, he knew like, he would pass would through, it. through it. He would pass through it. Yeah, because it's the, because it can be passed through. And I think that that's the narrative that everybody's bought is like, if you're suffering now, you cannot pass through it, which is actually true. Like you can't do it. And that was one of the things I think, Father, one of the first talks I ever heard you give was so sort of on this topic. Like the first time we met, I looked looked you up on YouTube. You're speaking to some a parish, I think, in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And they were like, they were interested in how do we do outreach to the black community here around us what can we do mm -hmm. and i remember it struck me and i was like oh this is this is this is for this real is the guy. because yeah. you said that you can't do anything mm -hmm. and i remember it was like uh like a, <laughs> like a vacuum was like sucked out of the it's room it's the same it's the same <laughs> as what we're trying to do yeah You're and it right, was like Cyprian. you can't do anything mm -hmm. and it was like <gasps> because then you were like no 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 it's christ that can do it mm -hmm. It's Christ that can do it, can do everything at the mm -hmm. second. If you want to do something, acknowledge that you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's exact. This is exactly the message. And the principle is like, that's the core. Stop. It's not you. It can't be you. It needs to stop being you empty yourself. But there was a long history of black folks embracing that em embracing oh, that. Course. You're right, father. There was a the church, in, 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 in the America church, because yeah. they were Christians. That's but now it. basically everybody got mulched up. But a different yeah. type of Christian as well, John, like yeah, I, I, right. the, the Christianity, like the black church is a much more incarnational church. Yeah. And it's, it's, and it's, it's much it's absolutely fully incarnational. incarnational. And it's because, because it's, if you're a Christian, it's all of your life. It isn't church and, on Sunday. It's all and, of your life. And I would say this. I remember having a conversation with with um, a mentor of mine. Uh, and we were having this kind of discussion. He's like, this is all good and dandy. I hear what you're saying. But he's like, I don't see the asceticism and I don't mm -hmm. see the sacraments. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I meant by the external, like that the, too see. much of a dichotomy of, of externals. Because I was like, well, the actual suffering is the asceticism. Mm -hmm. And the sacrament in this sense is the suffering and the obedience to the commandments of Christ, right? Because the commandment of Christ to turn the other cheek, not in a, I see, not in a weird self-deprecating way. Right. But I mean, if we, if we want to spend another four hours tearing that apart, we can do that. But that's something that people struggle with now, right? That's something that we talk a lot about here and have over the time of this project is, you know, there's a lot of folk who come from, you know, certain political stripes, you know, a lot of, you know, most most of the people who listen here, I think that's still a struggle. I'm going to say, you know, overall path moment of like this idea of turning the other cheek and what does that really look like? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? What does that really, really look like? And I think this is one of those things where when I say this thing about the sacrament that happens when you follow the commandments of Christ, I don't say that cheaply. I don't say that cheaply. I, I, I say that in the sense of the commandments of Christ in regards of, you know, this is St. Siloam the Athenite. Yep. He, who, he who does not, you know, who, he who cannot basically forgive his enemy or not love his enemy does not have Christ. Mm. Like, you really break that down. Mm. Most people aren't doing that. That's right. 
That's right. I mean, like, I, I'm just, I, I, I want to be as literal and forthright as I can. Most people aren't doing that. And I've said this before and I stand by it. Not so much in the absolute statement, but as close as I can to saying it without being out of line. Unless you've had that experience, you're not really a Christian. You know what I mean? You're just, you're just not. You're just not. I like, <laughs> I, I am so grateful for the people. I'm, I'm grateful for my enemies. I'm not saying that to be cheeky, because those moments, and it wasn't just the enemies I, I gained in 20. I've my whole life coming into the church. I've had people who either thought I was a Pharisee or they thought I was too whatever because of being mm -hmm. tattooed. Like I've always been like your rocket ship, John. I've always mm -hmm. kind of like been in the state, which is great. I'm thankful for it. But that's one of those things where I read the life of St. Silouan. I read these statements and I, and it's just like, Oh, it's like the commandments of the Lord that I've been experiencing. They become technicolor. Now it's like, yes, mm -hmm. this it's that sacrament of like loving your enemy of suffering. <laughs> Well, you know what? The, the thing that keeps appearing to me during our conversation, this one, but all these conversations I have about first things is humility and then and the term meek. Yes. So one of the most difficult things for me in our work is when I go visit, I got to go next month, actually, to Africa and to Georgia. Guys, meek people make proud westerners super uncomfortable mm -hmm. okay and i never really understood what that meant i'm talking about grown men who will come and hold my stuff while i just sit there to talk to a, a chief or something and then follow me like they are five years old and and they're grown and and i it's it makes me very uncomfortable and I want to take my stuff back and I don't want them to do that. And what I'm trying to say, I think uh, to tie it all in father is I think it's a type of eternal history. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's the history of humankind is to, it, we have to embrace the meekness. We don't want to do that at all, at all. Learn of me because I'm lowly and meek of heart. It's Christ. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is, this is the same, like, man, can you imagine? Nuts. It's a nuts idea, though. Who would, like, who would actually want to be around Christ? We we Think about this now. Oh, it'd be torture. It'd be torture, right? Think about this, because uh, the immigrant guy, right? Whether he's, you know, Laotian, you know, Vietnamese, uh, Mexican, El Salvadorian, Jamaican, uh, whatever. It's like, you know... The guy pulling in that's grabbing your bags. You know what I mean? It's incredible. Like, I'm thinking of Bakri. He lost his eye as a little kid. He never went to school. He was by my side. I'm going to cry right now thinking about it. By my side for everything. He became one of the foremen on the job. Mm -hmm. He was so proud of that bridge. I I've got goosebumps thinking about him. And you know what? He never instructed me in any way. He just was there at every moment. And taking care of me in every moment. He's the most exalted person, one of the most exalted people in my life. But if you met him, he came to New York. He stayed at our house. Mm, and mm. he kept looking around and saying, where does everyone go? Because <laughs> Man, John, and, and I think that's the thing is, if nothing else, like the work that you're doing, that's that, that's that word of actually meeting Christ. Oh, I or believe it. Oh, when did we feed you? When did we visit you? When did we see you as suffering? And it's like the your buddy who you're describing, it's like, oh Christ. You know what I mean? And He's and Bakri. people, they're super uncomfortable with that. And I'm like, ah. Oh, uh, we were all uncomfortable. Even 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 in 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 Mali, he was that person. Even to the Malians, they would always be like, Well, Barkley's simple. Man, what a beautiful person. But when he came to New York, I would go to work. My wife would go to work. My kids would go to school. And I'd be like, Barkley, we'll be home. And he would just be like, this is the saddest existence. He didn't say that. <laughs> but he would just be like, where did everybody go? He instructed so I you took on him. so much. You said oh, he didn't Lord. instruct you on anything. It sounds like he instructed you on so much. <laughs> like, a, like a champ. Like a champ. Yeah, that guy, man. Okay, so yeah. we, we're at two hours.
Yes, we uh, are. We, we usually have a, a, Andrew has a little outro uh, question, but since we have a guest, I have a question for you that has been bugging me and bothering me. <laughs> so, so your project is why are we talking about rabbits? Oh, great. I want to talk about that. Okay. And so this has been bothering me because I'm like, am I just, is, is this some like meta I really want to explain where if I don't get this meeting, I'm a huge dummy. So can you go ahead and just instruct me? (laughs) You just made my dip father. (laughs) Now I know why you got this guy around. (laughs) Now I know why you got him around. (laughs) That is, that's awesome. So here it is. The podcast had was its own entity when it started, but now it's pretty much fused with first things. The podcast is asking the question, ironically, why are we talking about rabbits? Meaning on the internet, you've got all this garbage jumping around, reproducing, and then down rabbit holes. And like, why are we doing this? Let's actually talk about something of merit, but let's do it lightly so we don't drive everybody nuts. So why let's not let's let's do this again where we take a look at the cultural ideas, but a little deeper, bring in the old world, new world. So that's all it is. That's all it is. I love it. I love That's it. it. I love it. That's well, it. thank you for uh, thank you for being here. This was this was great. I mean, it's not great that Andrew is not feeling well, but the providence, uh, the fact that you were available, yeah. I, I think the timing, the conversation. It, oh, we appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, well, well I had a goal to come on here, uh, and okay. uh, you guys made it true. <laughs> well, let's so. do it again. Let's do it again. This is fantastic. Good. Thank you, guys. Um, okay, so uh, I guess just to end this, I guess since I'm the host, I got to do the things that Andrew does. Um, Royal Path playlist on Spotify. Royal Path podcast podcast playlist. Merch store. Royalpath.store. If you want to get in touch with any of us, Andrew at Royalpath.network. And uh, oh, links to. All of the things that we talked about, John's Super. organization, all of that in the description check them out. for everybody. Yes, check please, them out. Please Support. go check it out. I have a feeling with our audience, particularly some of the young men, that you might be getting some people reaching out wanting to participate at a deeper level with you. I have a, I have a distinct feeling about that. Let's let it be true. It's the toughest thing is finding really good folks to go a little deeper and maybe even go into the field hard thing to do there we go the hard things all right well i guess then that's going to be it so uh uh, as andrew always says thank you for having a good night (laughs) (laughs) that's perfect love you guys